All right, please be seated as I pray. Oh, Father, we long for that day when the earth will be filled with your glory. We know that the earth will be filled with your glory as your son comes to rule and reign on this earth. And I pray for us. Lord, I pray that as we look at this final chapter of this wonderful book, that you would grant us your grace to see your son precisely for who he is. So God, help us now, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Zechariah chapter 14. We are on the last final book of Zechariah. Fact-checking is always very important, so I need to correct myself here. I prayed earlier for Garrett Butcher. Garrett is fine. (laughs) It is his younger brother, Gavin, who needs prayer and is receiving prayer and fellowship and care. So I'll be praying for him. Fact check, very important. All right, think about this. We are in an election year. New promises made by the one who is elected. He signs new legislation into law. He establishes new policies. He appoints new judges supposed to set the country on a a new course. All that is true. But one question we ask here is, how long does that new direction last? One, maybe two election cycles. How long do those appointments last? Uh, Our longest standing Supreme Court justice has been serving for 32 years. A new administration is eventually gonna come along and the old policies are overturned. Well, let's go back to the name Zechariah itself. The Hebrew word Zakar means to remember. So Zakar Yah means Yah or Yahweh, God remembers. And what God remembers is his promise to Israel. And his promise to Israel is, I'm going to give you a land, and I am going to give you a Messiah, and he will rule over you, and you will worship that Messiah from your heart in this land, and his rule will never end. So as we look at this last chapter of God's apocalyptic revelation, that's exactly what we're going to find. The final era of human history on this earth will consist of two things. First, it's going to consist of Christ's return to his kingdom. And then a little while later, we're going to see starting in verse 9, that it consists of Christ's glory in his kingdom. So let's look at verses 1 through 8 and look at Christ's return to his kingdom. And what we're going to see at the beginning of all of this is that Jerusalem is ravaged. We're going to see a ravaged Jerusalem. This is going backwards in time just a bit from what we saw in chapters 12 and 13. This is going back to what is taking place when the nations are actually succeeding in their battle against Israel. Let's read verses 1 and 2 and see the details. Zechariah writes, Behold, a day is coming for Yahweh when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you, Indeed, I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half of the city will go forth in exile. But those left of the people will not be cut off from the city. Zechariah starts by writing, Behold. He gets our attention. You need to look at this. As you look at the end of chapter 13, verse 9, it was all about God's work to redeem the one-third of the Jews. It was great news, but, but what Zechariah is telling us here is it's going to get bad before it gets better. And you need to understand exactly how bad it's going to get. He says, a day is coming. He's pointing to, again, that, that great and terrible battle, the battle of Armageddon. But he says, this day is coming for Yahweh. That's what we need to understand in all of this as we step back and and try and keep our mind around the book of Zechariah, regardless of the details of what comes next. This is all about Messiah Jesus. This is all about him. The focus is on him. And he is the centerpiece of this whole story right in front of us. So he says to, to the Jews, spoil will be taken from you. And he says also, it will be divided among you. The time frame here again is that battle at Armageddon and all the Jews are in the promised land and they're surrounded by these armies. And initially the battle is going to go very, very badly for Israel, very badly for them. Nations will take spoil from Israel, but they not only will take it, they will actually revel in it. Zechariah is telling Israel, they're going to eat your food. They will live in your houses. They will wear your garments. They will rape your women. All of it will be done with zest 
and zeal and vigor, it's going to get really, really bad. And the details of this are in the first half of, of verse 2. It's going to get so bad that half of the city is going to go into exile. Those in the city are going to leave. They will have nowhere to go. They will just run from the city. Back to verse 8 of chapter 13. This will be part of the two-thirds that will be cut off from the land. These people will be running to their death. Many of them will be running to their death. This is the ruin of Jerusalem. As we look at this, we need to notice the helplessness that's in these people. The nations that are gathered against them are on a roll. It appears to them that there is nothing that can stop them. Nothing whatsoever. There's nothing that Israel can do. Israel needs to know that they literally will be headed for destruction and extinction and extermination. But if God is going to keep all of these promises to Israel, if he truly is going to be Zechariah, if he's going to be that God who keeps his promise, then Jerusalem needs to be rescued. And that's what we see in verses 3 through 5. A rescued Jerusalem. So let's read it together. Then Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations as the day when he fights on a battle, a day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from the east to the west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. And you will flee by the valley of my mountains. For the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Indeed, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then Yahweh, my God, will come and all the holy ones with him. So again, he starts by saying then. So this is after the death of the two thirds that are going to be cut off from the land. But notice what Jesus does here. Yahweh will go forth and fight against these nations. This is an active fighting. This is not passive. Jesus is not passively sitting there watching this all happen and waving a wand over this. He is actively fighting. To get this, we need to see Jesus' disposition towards all of this. So let's turn briefly to Revelation chapter 19. And we want to see things about Jesus that are true. This is the same event that is taking place here when Jesus arrives. We're going to look at verse 11 and following here. And we're going to make some observations about Jesus himself, what he is like. John is writing and he says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse... And he who sits on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire. Down to verse 13. He is clothed with a garment dipped in blood. In verse 14. The armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. So Jesus is on a white horse. White is the color of victory. We know this. So Jesus is coming to conquer. There will be absolutely no doubt as to the outcome. We don't have to guess as to the outcome of this. Jesus appears and he is going to be conquering. In righteousness, he judges and wages war. So we need to understand that, that everything that is taking place here, that everything that Jesus is going to begin doing is going to be characterized by righteousness. There will be death and judgment, and that will be righteousness. There will be salvation. And that will be righteous. Everything will be right. But notice here what he's clothed with. He's clothed with a garment that is dipped in blood. What we need to understand is that it's already dipped in blood. Messiah Jesus has been a victorious warrior in the past, and he will be again at Armageddon. When you read your Old Testament, you, you know that you're reading that there are many, many events that have taken place where Israel has been spared and Messiah Jesus is behind those fighting for his people. So that's Jesus. He is all about righteous war. He's all about the righteous judgment of the nations. Now let's go back to Zechariah chapter 14. We'll take a look at verse 4 and go from there. This is really amazing. Jesus' feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. If you look at Jerusalem from above, the Mount of Olives is to the right, it's to the east. And historically, this was the path of Israel's flight when they were in trouble. King David took this path. He fled that way when Absalom was seeking to displace him. 
King Zedekiah fled that way when Nebuchadnezzar was coming and laid siege on, on Jerusalem and was later going to take everybody away. The Jews know their history. They, they know this. They know what the Mount of Olives is. They know that it's a place where, where Israel flees. They've seen this before. And they're wondering, is this going to be like every single time in the past? Are we going to have to run and run and run? And will it be bad for us just like it was in the past? And the answer is no, because Jesus is going to stand on the Mount of Olives. And we look at this and the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from east to west by a very large valley that's running. And so that half of the mountain moves to the north and half of the mountain moves to the south. And Jesus himself is going to be producing a massive seismic geological event that is going to divide this mountain in half. And he's going to put a plane in the middle of this. This is just one of the signs that Jesus is coming to conquer. He's going to be saying to the nations, you need to know that I'm going to rule over everything. I not only rule over you, but I rule over the land and the ground that you're standing on. And so Zechariah sees all of this and he says, Yahweh, my God, will come. Now, remember, Zechariah is speaking. It's about 480 BC in this time frame, something like that. And he's talking about something that's coming way in the future to them, future for us. But he takes us right back into his time frame and he says, my God. He says, my God, my God will come. What he wants us to understand is that Messiah Jesus is a personal God. Even if you're talking about events that are centuries and millennia into the future, Messiah Jesus is a personal God. But he also says he's going to come with all of these holy ones with him. And we need to understand this. This is very important for the, the church today, the New Testament and the church age people to understand exactly what's being spoken. Zechariah says all the holy ones are going to be with him. So who are these holy ones? Well, there are two groups that are represented here, and we're going to turn to our New Testament to see what those are. First, let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll see exactly who one of these people are. They're resurrection saints. The story here in 1 Thessalonians 4 is Paul did not have a lot of time to spend with these, this church. He went by God's grace to Thessalonica, and by God's grace, the church was raised up very quickly. He didn't stay very long because there was persecution. He was run out of town. He did not have the time to develop a full theology with them. They knew a lot of things about salvation, but they were lacking in some of their understandings. And one of their questions was, what will take place when we die? Where do we go? What happens? And so in the verses prior to this, Paul explains the rapture that is coming, that Christ is going to come and he's going to take his church to be with him. Verse 17 after he describes the, the resurrection of those who have died in Christ, how they've been resurrected from the dead and meet with Christ, he says, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And this is the key part that we need to see. So that we shall always be with the Lord. Again, this is the rapture of the church. The church is taken away from this world. They are taken to be with Christ. They're going to receive resurrection bodies and look at what it says. They will always be with the Lord. Not only with him during the seven years of this tribulation that is going to be taking place, but they will be with him after that, especially during the battle at Armageddon. So they will be there. So that is one of the groups of people, one of the set of the holy ones who will be with him. And the other are the angels. The context here we're going to take a look at is um, Matthew chapter 25. So turn in your Bibles to Matthew 25. We'll take a look there. And Jesus has just spoken the parable of the talents here. And he's beginning to explain the judgment of the sheep and the goats when he says this. This is going to help us understand that the angels are the, the other piece that are going to be attending to Jesus as he exits from heaven and comes down to earth to establish his rule and reign. Matthew 25, 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, so this is the second coming of Jesus Christ, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Notice that all of the angels are with him. Myriads upon myriads of angels are attending with him. They will be with him when he comes at this time. So stepping back, we have all of these resurrection saints, all of those who died in Christ in the church age are going to be with Christ with resurrection bodies. And all of the angels will be there as well. Think about these resurrection saints. This is good for us to just stop and, and contemplate for a minute. We will be with Christ. We'll be looking at this, this massive army 
that has assembled to exterminate Israel and has had great success so far. And the church age saints are gonna be wearing white linen and that's it. They won't have any weapons, they won't have any ammunition, no weapons, no ammunition, but no problem because we're gonna be clothed with an imperishable resurrection body. That's pretty exciting. Those are the ones who are with Christ. That is who Zechariah is speaking of. So let's go back to chapter 14, verse five, all the holy ones with him. They will all be with Christ. They'll be in the presence of the one who will rescue his people by destroying the enemy. Use that to fortify your prayer life when you're wondering what to pray about in the future, when you're wondering if you're not really sure if you can be confident in who Christ is and what he's doing, you are going to be with him when he is doing this. And again, Messiah is all about righteous war, righteous judgment of the nations. So what we have here is that Jerusalem is plundered and then Jerusalem is rescued, they're rescued by Christ. And what does Christ do next? He restores the land. We're gonna read about the restoration of Jerusalem in verses six through eight. The key to understanding this passage is that God is replacing existing sources of light and water. He's replacing and replenishing them. And he's replacing them with the purity and the radiance of Christ. So let's read verses six through eight with that in mind. And it will be in that day that there will be no light, the luminaries will dwindle. And it will be a unique day which is known to Yahweh, neither day nor night, but it will be that at evening there will be light. And it will be in that day that living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the Eastern Sea and the other half toward the Western Sea. And it will be in summer as well as in winter. That day, same time frame. We're all in the same picture here. This is the same time frame. He says there will be no light. Zechariah says there will be an absence of light initially. Darkness is going to overtake the world. And that is going to be part of God's judgment and part of God's wrath on the unbelieving world. Their ability to see will be diminished because darkness is overtaking the world. There will be no light there. And Zechariah tells us a little bit more detail on what that really looks like. He says the luminaries will dwindle in the legacy Bible. The sun and the moon will actually lose their luminescence. What we've always used as a means of light and what we've always used as a means of, of marking time will be done away with. And what this does is this signifies a new source of light is coming. A new way of measuring time is coming. And we read about that when he says, Zechariah tells us that this will be a unique day known to Yahweh. And the Hebrew is very important for us to get here. The Hebrew is saying there will be a day of one in number. Zechariah is pointing to one day. One day is coming. And this is very, very significant because it marks the end of this age and the way that light is pervasive in this world. And it marks the beginning of the millennial kingdom. And God is the only one who knows this. But he says there will be neither day nor night. But in the millennial kingdom, there will be day or night, but they won't be separated by darkness because the darkness itself will be banished. It will be at that evening that there will be light. In the millennial kingdom, there will be a new kind of light, a kind of light that shines during the day and the night. And that light is from Yahweh Jesus himself. So let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 60 to see how we can know this. Isaiah 60 verse 19, what we're gonna see here is that the light that Zechariah is speaking of is coming from Christ himself. Isaiah 60 verse 19. What I love about this is the way that scripture comes together. You're reading in different parts of your Bible and you have scripture corroborating scripture. This is so helpful. By the way, that means read your Bible. Get a reading plan that will take you through all of your Bible and read it. Doesn't matter whether it takes you six months or six years to get through your Bible, but read your Bible. Isaiah 60 verse 19. No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor for brightness will the moon give you light, but you will have Yahweh for an everlasting light and your God for your glory. There we have it. Christ is going to be the source of light in the millennial kingdom. Also, we learn that water is gonna be replenished and renewed. Living waters will flow out of Jerusalem. 
Sometime when you're on your reading plan, you need to make sure that you read Ezekiel chapter 47. What is described there is this river that begins flowing out of the temple in Jerusalem. And it flows out away from Jerusalem. But what's unique about this river is that the farther you get from Jerusalem, the deeper and the stronger the current gets. There's more and more water. This is really really astounding because if you look at a satellite image of Israel today and you look down, you'll see some green in the north. It's a fertile land in the north. But if you look in the south, especially in the Negev region, it is a very dry and arid place. And you can just see the picture as being described here. There is water that is going to be flowing through. And it will happen in summer and in winter, Zechariah tells us. And what this helps us understand is that Israel will no longer be dependent upon seasonal rains because this water is going to be flowing from the temple. It will be a verdant, fruitful, clean, productive land all the time. Let me just read one verse from Ezekiel 47 to help us get a feel for this. These waters go out toward the eastern region and down into the Arabah. They go toward the sea, being made to flow into the seas, and the waters of the sea become fresh. There is so much water flowing as you get farther and farther from the temple, that the oceans themselves, the seas themselves become fresh. This is the reversal of the curse. This is what the earth is groaning for when you read Romans 8. The creation was subjected to futility, but it's going to be set free from its slavery to corruption. And part of that is the refreshing of the water in the oceans. This is the opposite of the flood where water represented God's judgment. This is water is representing the cleansing work of salvation that is available through Christ, a renewed land. So Jerusalem itself will be ruined as a part of God's judgment of the Jew. And then Jesus comes and he rescues them and he renews the land and he removes the sun and the moon from their prominence and he purges the oceans of their salinity and all of their salt. Are you starting to see the preeminence of Christ in all of this? Rebellious Israel is judged. Two-thirds of them die. A third of them are on the brink of destruction and extinction. And Messiah Jesus appears and he rescues them. And then Messiah Jesus himself restores the earth. The preeminence and the glory of Christ is really, really hard to miss as you read this part of your Bible. And that's what's on display for the rest of this book is the glory of Christ in his kingdom. Let's take a look at that in verses 9 through 21. Christ's glory in his kingdom. And when you talk about Christ's glory, the first thing that you need to establish when you think about Christ's glory is his absolute supremacy over everything. You really can't have the glory of Christ on display without his supremacy over everything. And that's what you see in verse nine. You see an undisputed king. This is my favorite verse in this whole book because this is the culmination of what takes place. And Yahweh will be king over all the earth in that day. Yes, he's ruling from Jerusalem. He's ruling over the promised land, but he will be king over all the earth. In, Yah in that day, Yahweh will be the only one and his name one. So he's not ruling over a small part of the earth. He's ruling over the entire earth. There will be nations, there will be laws, there will be commerce, there will be agriculture that's taking place, but all of it will submit to Messiah Jesus and his rule and his reign. And he says, Zechariah writes that Yahweh will be the only one and his name will be one. Think back to what God told Israel in Deuteronomy chapter six. They're on the Western side, Eastern side of the Jordan River. They're looking to travel across into the West to take the promised land. And what does God tell them? He says, hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. There's no more competition for anything else. There is one God who does everything. Yahweh is one because his name is one. There will be nations and peoples all over the earth, but there will be one and only one ruler. The world has never really known anything like this. This is going to be fantastic. So there will be an undisputed king, but there will also be an exalted Jerusalem. That's the next thing we need to see. And that's in verses 10 and 11. And this is remarkable. What we're going to see here is that Jerusalem itself is going to be raised. The whole city is going to be raised to a point of geological and geographic prominence. 
All the land will be changed into a plain from Geba to Rimon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and inhabit its site from Benjamin's gate, as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. And the people will inhabit it, and there will no longer be anything devoted to destruction, for Jerusalem will be inhabited in security. So the land around Jerusalem is going to be changed into a plain so that Christ and his rule will be exalted and everybody will be looking up to Christ. The surrounding area will be lower than Jerusalem. And people will inhabit. The idea here again is that people are going to be inhabiting Jerusalem in this exalted place. It's going to be a permanent residence. No longer will there be anything that's devoted to destruction. That tells us that the promised land will be a holy place. When Israel took the promised land under Joshua, they destroyed all the cities and to honor the Lord, they devoted things to destruction. But God is saying now, when you take this, when Christ comes and establishes his rule and his reign, there will be nothing unholy in all of it. All of it will be holy. All right. So to further demonstrate Christ's glory, God shows us the result of the battle at Armageddon from the enemy's perspective. And we're going to see that in verses 12 through 15, a crushed enemy. We've alluded to this before. This is good for us to actually get another look at it because this is telling us what Christ himself will do here. And again, remember, when he appears and shows up, he's going to be wearing these garments that are already dripping in blood from prior engagements with the enemy. Verses 12 through 15. Now this will be the plague with which Yahweh will plague all the peoples who have gone to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet and their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongue will rot in their mouth. And it will be in that day that abundant confusion from Yahweh will fall on them and they will take hold of one another's hand and the hand of one will go up against the hand of another and Judah also will fight at Jerusalem. And the wealth of all the surrounding nations will be gathered gold and silver and garments in great abundance. In the same way, the plague on the horse, the mule, the camel, the donkey, and all the cattle that will be in those camps will be like this plague. So Yahweh himself is going to plague all of the peoples who have gone to war against Jerusalem. This is not due to the strength of the Jewish people. Yes, they are fighting, but the plague itself is from Messiah Jesus himself. Their flesh is going to rot and their, their sockets and their eyes are going to be rotting. They're going to be standing on their feet. Literally, the soldiers are going to be decomposing right before themselves while they are fighting. That is how astounding Jesus is. Their eyes will rot, their tongues will rot, they won't be able to see, they won't be able to speak. Confusion will come from Yahweh, and it's not just because they can't see or speak, but they'll be beset with irrationality that is from Yahweh himself. They can't think clearly. The hand of one will go up against the hand of another. They literally will kill one another. And we say to ourselves, well, how does that exalt Messiah Jesus? The answer is that he is so sovereign that sinful man can't even fight against him, even if he tries. And if he does try, he doesn't end up fighting against Yahweh. He ends up fighting against himself. And then there will be a plague on the horse and the mule and the donkey and the cattle. It will be like this plague. And what we need to think about here is supply chain. Supply chain in war. The war horses, the supply animals, the source of food, Everything will rot as well. There will be no strength in any place. Not only will sinful man himself be decomposing, but all the resources that he historically has drawn upon will also be rotting away as well. Look at what Ezekiel writes in chapter 39. Let's go there. Ezekiel 39, we'll look at verses 11 through 13. And we are going to see just how devastating this is, what an effect this has on these armies. And this is almost fantastic. You almost can't believe this when you read this, but you need to remember that this is inspired scripture. This is not a movie. Ezekiel 39, we're going to read verses 11 through 13. It will be in that day that I will give Gog a burial ground there in Israel. 
So they will bury Gog there with all his multitude. And for seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Even all the people of the land will bury them and it will be unto their name on the day that I glorify myself, declares the Lord Yahweh. So the land is gonna be polluted with the bodies of dead Gentile soldiers, so much so that the Jews will join together to bury them. All of the Jews will gather together until the enemy is absolutely removed and it will take them seven months to cleanse the land and bury all of the dead bodies. So Christ isn't glorified simply by crushing his enemies. He has an effect on those he saves. And that effect is that it elicits worship unto him. And we see that next. The glory of Christ is gonna be displayed in a worshiping people, verses 19, 16 to 19. And here the, the time frame moves back to the millennial kingdom. The battle of Armageddon is in the rear view now. Everything is gone and it's done and they're looking back and Jesus is supreme. And what we need to understand as we read this is that more than Israel is in view here, much more than Israel. And look for that as we read verses 16 through 19. Then it will be that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the King, Yahweh of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, Yahweh of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up or enter, then no rain will fall on them. And it will be the plague with which Yahweh plagues the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. So this is referring to all of the Gentiles, all the peoples of the world are gathered together. All the nations that went up, from those nations there are people left who did not actually participate in the battle. They are there. And the word is that all of them will go up from year to year to worship the King Yahweh of hosts. What we need to understand is that these people don't possess resurrection bodies. These are living people, people who have bodies just like yours and mine. Here you have God's mercy to them. They survived the, the battle of Armageddon. They are there, they are living. They are going to be making an annual pilgrimage. But notice what they're going to do. They're going to celebrate the Feast of Booths. The Feast of Booths is how Israel traditionally celebrated that God brought them into the promised land. They would gather annually, or they were supposed to, and they would gather annually and, and gather together and they would make these booths. And what these booths would symbolize is the fact that God brought them into the promised land. But here they're, they're recognizing and celebrating something else. They're not celebrating that they arrived. They're celebrating that they're staying. They're staying and that they will never, ever leave. But then we notice that there are some caveats here. This is very important for us to understand. Whichever does not go up to Jerusalem, no rain will fall upon them. All of the world is there. And those that haven't yet yet come and worship, they will receive no rain. And this is not really a, a slap on the wrist. What this is, is God saying, you need to understand that worship of Messiah Jesus is so important. It is so essential that failure to do so comes with the most severe consequences. So the Jew and the Gentile are gathered together and they are celebrating Christ's reign together. So you have Jew and you have Gentile together in this place. There is an annual pilgrimage where people from all over the world come and they, they celebrate the fact that, that God has planted his people in the promised land and they will never leave. What we see lastly is a pervasive or a prevailing holiness. What we see here is that God is going to establish a level of holiness throughout the land in things that we look at and say, yes, those are holy things, but also in things that we look at and say, oh, is that really a holy thing. We, we look at it and we think, well, that's something that is more common in its use. So let's read verses 20 and 21 and see how it is that, that God establishes a prevailing holiness. In that day, there will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to Yahweh. And the pots in the house of Yahweh will be like the bowls before the altar. 
and every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah will be holy to Yahweh of hosts, and all who sacrifice will come and take of them and boil in them, and there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of Yahweh of hosts in that day. The main idea here is that everything in the promised land is going to be holy, every single thing, especially those things that previously were considered to be base or unclean. They're going to be viewed as holy as well. Christ is of such great worth that all things are holy before him. At the very beginning of verse 20, you see horses that are mentioned. Horses are an instrument of war. Horses are used to carry men into war. They're used as mechanisms in the war. They're also mentioned as things that men are not to rely upon. We're not to put our confidence and our strength in horses, but in God himself. We get some clarity on what is being referred to here, that these things that are unholy are going to be viewed as holy. Let's read Isaiah 66, verse 20. And we're going to see how it is that something that was, was not esteemed as something that was necessarily holy will be viewed as holy. Isaiah 66 and verse 20, very near to the end of Isaiah's writing. Isaiah is speaking of the same time frame himself. Then the saints shall bring all your brothers from all the nations as a grain offering to Yahweh on horses, in chariots, in litters, on mules, and on camels to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says Yahweh. Just as the sons of Israel bring their offering in a clean vessel to the house of Yahweh. So these believers are going to be making their pilgrimage to the promised land to celebrate the Feast of Booths, and they're going to be coming on horses. And these horses will be adorned with bells to signal the celebration. It's a sign on the bells will say, Holy to Yahweh. So these horses are going to have bells upon them as they travel to the promised land. And there will be a sign on those bells that say, this beast is holy before God. Christ is of such great worth that even the horses who don't have a soul are going to be considered as holy. But also, in addition to that, you see reference to every pot will be like bowls before the altar. Well, pots were made of clay. They were to serve a very lowly purpose. They were for washing dirty things like your feet and your hands when they get dirty. But they're going to be like bowls before the altar. The bowls were not like the pots. Pots and bowls were very different things. Very, very different. The bowl was made of precious metals. And it was used to hold the blood of animal sacrifices. Even the most common utensils will be accorded the same kind of honor. than something that already possesses that honor. So you see that everything in the, the promised land is going to be holy. There will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of Yahweh of hosts. The Canaanite was somebody who is unclean. If we think back to Israel's history again and again and again, Israel's temple was defiled. You think about what Nebuchadnezzar did to the temple. He came in and he destroyed the temple and he burned it and he carried off all of the articles that were used in the sacrificial system. He defiled it. Rome defiled it. The Antichrist is going to do the same thing. He's going to establish himself in the temple and defile it. And then Israel themselves, you think about what they did to the temple. They had their temple prostitutes. And they drew pictures of idols on the walls of the temple. That's how they defiled the temple. But it will never again be defiled. So you have this picture of this land. This land is a land where Christ is exalted. He's ruling and reigning. And everything in that land is holy. And you notice how the, the entire book ends. It ends in the legacy Bible with the phrase, in that day. Isn't that a fitting ending for the, the last phrase of this book? If you read chapters 12 through 14, you'll notice that phrase occurs 17 times. 17 times there's a reference to in that day. Human history culminates in Messiah's rescue of his people. It culminates in his defeat of the nations, his renewal of the earth, and his rule over the earth. And all of it will redound to Christ's glory. So I have three points of application for us. And this is... This is good for us to stop and think about. When, when you read 
the book of Zechariah, there are just fantastic things in front of you. You read them and you almost ask yourself, is this even going to be true? But there are three applications for us. And the first is evaluate your eschatology. Make sure that when you're reading your Bibles, you're reading carefully and you're observing what God says about how this age is going to come to an end. Make sure you understand what the tribulation is. Make sure you understand what the millennium is and the millennial kingdom. Make sure you really know what you mean when you say, I'm going to go to heaven when I die. But don't stop there. Evaluate your eschatology, but also evaluate your motivation. Use the truths of this wonderful book to motivate godly living. These, again, are just fantastic realities. This is the way that, that the kingdom is going to be. It's going to exist for a thousand years with Christ ruling and reigning. And the knowledge of what that will be like then should inform us and in what our behavior and our thoughts and our decisions and our relationships and our service and our worship should be like today. So make sure you, you take away from this the motivation in all of this is to bring glory to Christ. And lastly, evaluate your treasure. Zechariah, again, is just full of fantastic realities. Every single one of these is going to come true. You look at these and you say, I wonder what that's really going to be like. I wonder how that's really going to play out. And those are the good things to ponder, good things to think through, but make sure that what you cherish most is Christ ruling over your own heart. So let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this book that you gave to your people. You gave this book to your people so that they could know that there is a Messiah, that the one who was to come and give his life on a cross is the one who will come again. He is going to come to establish his rule and his reign over this earth. I pray for us. I pray that as we think carefully about who we are before you, who we are and how we live here today, that your son, Jesus Christ, will be ruler of our hearts. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.